So we're looking at a number of passages, not the least of which is this one here, Colossians 1, 9 to 12, 21 to 23, live a worthy life, and the believer will share in the inheritance of the kingdom of life. For this reason, also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you believers, verse 2, will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience and joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. I hope for longer moments in this. When I study scripture, I focus on this and I'm at peace most of the time. And so I had those moments perhaps that the Father is uh, rewarding me by studying scripture, keeping other distractions at a minimum. Verse 21, And although you were formerly alienated, and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. He's going to do the presentation. It's not up to you to be blameless, but to focus on him and the goal that's before you. And if indeed, especially since you Colossian believers continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So in Colossians 1.23, the verb form, epimente, in the Greek phrase rendered, if indeed you continue in the faith, is in the indicative mood, with the Greek word agi, rendered if indeed, meaning since, conveying together the sense of especially since. The indicative mood is the first class if then expression, meaning since it is indeed especially true that the Colossian believers were dedicating their lives toward this purpose. This is deliberately emphatic expression, emphatically explaining, declaring how the faithful the Colossian believers were. Paul was stating, Surely you, the faithful Colossian believers, will all the more be presented holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight albeit their presentation is holy and blameless, would be solely by the grace of God through a single moment of faith alone in Christ alone plus nothing else. Let me restate that. Paul was stating, surely the faithful believers will all the more be presented holy and blameless because of their efforts to be faithful. They weren't perfect. And above reproach in his sight by the grace of God, albeit their presentation is holy and blameless, will be solely by the grace of God through a single moment of faith alone in Christ alone Plus nothing else. God will carry you to holiness and blamelessness. You're adding to that with your effort to be faithful in terms of eternal rewards because of what Christ did on the cross and not do in any way to what a believer might do. Let me correct that spelling. Compare Galatians 3, 23 to 24. Believers are to work for the Lord so that they will receive an inheritance as a reward when they gain entrance into heaven. Gain entrance, you inherit an eternal life at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone. What about the co-rulership, the ownership? Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Simplistically, I say, Study the Word of God, and what I've been doing lately is sharing what I've just learned. I just learned something wonderful. Pictures I got on the internet from AnswersInGenesis.org of trees slicing through and embedded in rock strata that is supposed to be separated by hundreds of millions of years. How did that one tree go through? One tree only had one short 
40 year life maybe and it's coming through hundreds of millions of years of worth of rock strata or is that rock strata really represent hundreds of millions of years perhaps it all was impacted in an instant with a worldwide flood or a local flood Mount St. Helens is an example of that those trees and that rock strata that those trees are in that were shaved off cut off thousands of them in the bed in the lake I think it was Lincoln Lake there they're embedded in the bottom of that lake because they sank and embedded themselves in the soft bottom of that lake. They weren't there millions of years. And since eternal life in the sense of salvation from hell is only received through a moment of faith alone, not by any works, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and not as a reward but as a gift, then the reward of the inheritance for performing works for the Lord in view in Colossians 3, 23 to 24 is it evidently something more than salvation from hell, an inheritance as a reward that the believer receives when he enters heaven for his faithfulness during his mortal life. It is an inheritance as a reward. Now, you get to heaven, and then you get to collect, receive these wonderful rewards for your faithfulness, your attempts to be faithful by the leading of the Holy Spirit within you. Find direction. Get information in your mind, which is study scripture, especially I love the epistles. Now here's something in 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. If we believers endure, in other words, live faithful lives, we shall also reign with him. If we believers disown Christ's ownership of us, i.e. be unfaithful, he will disown our inheritance of reigning with him. So it is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. That's eternal life. We die with him by what? Trusting alone in him alone, in his death for us, we become incorporated into the benefits of what he died and did for us. It says if we were baptized in him, dying on the cross, we were there on the cross because he represented us dying for our sins. So we will have eternal life, eternally with him. So if we endure, oh, that's different, that's additional, we'll also reign with him. If we deny him, we will, he also will deny us. Wait a minute. Will he deny our salvation? Let's keep reading. If we are faithless, he remains faithful to his promise, for he cannot deny himself. So if we believers who are secure in our eternal life endure the difficulties in testing and live a faithful, productive life full of divine good production, then we believers will not only have eternal life with Jesus Christ in heaven because of our one-time expression of faith in him, but we'll also reign, co-rule with him, and receive unimaginably glorious rewards. What kind of authority and power do we have if we're going to judge the angels, the ones that rebel? If we believers disown, disavow Christ's ownership of us by acting in thought, word, and deed, and disobedience and unfaithfulness, then Christ will disown our ownership, ah, our inheritance of eternal rewards, and co-rulership with him. We have that slated for us. Just live up to that by making the effort, following the leading of the Holy Spirit, and allowing and thanking God for the grace that enables you to be qualified to have eternal rewards. James 2, 1 to 5. God's sovereignty of choosing the poor to be heirs of the kingdom and believers, free will choice to persevere on the trials unto the righteousness, the righteous life that God desires, resulting in becoming an heir to the kingdom are both in view. I guess I do better when I share my faith. I shared my faith with an, uh, I think it was a 90-year-old man in the late 80s. And he's watching this pastor that I was investigating this morning who doesn't have the gospel right. He thinks you have to, to uh, you, you have to demonstrate your, your uh, eternal life by being faithful. Uh, otherwise, you weren't saved at all. But how much does that take? And he was listening to that. I, I'm glad he's listening because some of the words he might take, but maybe I can speak to him the next time, uh, he might take them correctly because the pastor says things, quotes verses, but then he twists the meaning of it. James 2.1, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, 
and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my footstool. You, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, do not sin. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? All these passages indicate that your deeds will provide unimaginably great rewards in heaven, co-rulership, co-ownership of the kingdom of God, but not salvation unto eternal life, destiny. That is by faith alone. Okay, Matthew 10. Take up your cross, be worthy, confess and be confessed before the Father, and deny and be denied your eternal inheritance, but never your gift of eternal life. When you say, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, gift of God. It's a gift. Then how can, like this pastor do, do, does, take it back and say, well, yeah, but you're dedicated now to doing good works. So get busy. If you don't, you never got it in the first place. You can't do good works to get a gift. Any more than if your parents give you a birthday gift, you reach into your wallet and pay them for it. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. I'm talking about rewards here. Be worthy. God, in his grace, will declare you worthy when you fall short, which is all the time. Matthew 5, 1 to 5 and 9 to 12. The Beatitudes, the meek, those who are faithful, shall inherit the earth. Interesting. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Nine Beatitudes are hereafter presented by our Lord to the disciples, and the and the crowd on the mountainside. But his message this time is specifically directed to believers, especially his disciples, and especially about believers being rewarded in heaven for being faithful. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is theirs, their inheritance is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the term beatitude, or blessed comes from the Latin beatus, which means blessings, and in this context, temporal plus especially eternal blessings or reward. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Our Lord is not describing poverty types. The word poor means aware of one's own spiritual poverty, spiritual bankruptcy relative to the righteousness of God. Thus, through recognition of one's true poverty in spirit, one can rely on the grace of God instead of one's own righteousness for eternal life. One is therefore blessed by God's grace with eternal life so that one may inherit eternal life. But this verse goes further than that. For those believers who are poor in spirit, for it rewards those who continue to be poor in spirit with an inheritance of the kingdom of heaven. You have the inherited kingdom. You have inherited eternal life by faith alone. But now, but now, you can also be poor in spirit in the sense of being faithful and allowing to continue to be poor in spirit with an inheritance of the kingdom of heaven be presented to you. For theirs is their, the kingdom of heaven implies ownership as well as occupancy of the kingdom. Believers who recognize their own spiritual poverty and ther thereby rely on God's gracious working through him by the leading of the Holy Spirit in them rather than doing what they perceive as righteous acts will be following the path of a faithful lifestyle leading to the reward of their actual inheritance of the kingdom of heaven. And we go on to move on to verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. They shall inherit the kingdom of God, which comprises the earth, meek, gentleness, obedience, self-control, under the control of the Spirit. Since an obedient lifestyle is excluded from what is required for an individual to be saved, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that's not of yourselves, gift of God. So obedient lifestyle is excluded there, right? Then salvation is not in view, but the reward for the obedient believer of inheriting earth, the earth certainly is. No believer inherits the earth unless he is faithful. When a believer is faithful, he is under the control, filled with, or 
in submission to the Spirit within. He is obedient to the will of God. That's what produces the true meekness and the gentleness in a believer, submission and obedience. 